All righty. Welcome, everyone. Um, so this talk is Rust for Pythonus by Rob. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks. Um, so questions during the talk are completely fine. Just throw your hand up. If you're over there, make a sound as well. Because uh, I'm going to be looking this way. Every time I'm going to see the camera, I'm just going to sort of gaze off into it for a while. So let's not let that happen too much. So I, uh, I started using Rust for a pet project when I was between jobs a few months ago. And I wanted to do some stuff that was right down in the operating system, talking to network cards. And I thought, you know, Python, which is in many ways my favorite language, might not be a good fit for that. And then I looked around at the other languages and I was like, yeah, I've done C before and I know what that's like. Um, and there's Go, but Go does this green threading thing. And I actually wanted to have stuff that works directly with a network card. I care intensely with that particular bit of code about threads and what's going to execute where. So that wasn't a good fit. And I've been interested in Rust for many years. I dabbled with it um, years before when it was pre 1.0. And I was like, maybe it's time to dust this off um, clean it up with an iron brush, if you will, and get a good look at it. So I did that, and then Tommy's like, you know, we're, we're holding this conference, you should put a talk in. I was like, I don't really have any Python talks that I haven't given so many times on board of them, but I could talk a bit about Rust. He's like, sounds great. <laughs> so if this goes badly, all of which to say, if this goes badly, it's Tommy's fault, not mine. <laughs> so um, I'm going to give you the whole talk in about 30 seconds, and you can go and we'll stay and talk about some of the details. So Rust is really nice. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting language. I'm not going to try and teach you the language today. That would take too long. There's a lot to it. Um, but I'm going to give you, hopefully, some of the flavor of it and some of the bits that really stood out to me as being different from Python, things that make me stop and think about what I'm doing. You can call it from Python. You can integrate with it really quite well. and you can use it for Python extension modules. There's a poster, you should check out Tim McNamara's poster uh, about that. Um, it is enjoyable and productive, and um, like all things, it's, it's not perfect for every use case, but you're not crazy if you sort of sit down and say, hey, I'm gonna do something, and it could be something that's kind of scripty, or it could be something that's you know, hardcore data processing or whatever, and Rust can still probably do a pretty good job of it, because it's, a modern language. There's been a lot of stuff that's gone into language design over the last 25, 30 years, and the Rust folk learnt from that. So let's um, talk about what's the same. So Rust has a huge community. A lot of people who sit down say, you should go and get involved in Rust because it's got a great community. And it really does. They have, um, they have consciously decided what sort of community and culture they want, and they've tried to build that from the way code reviews are conducted, to whether they use mailing lists or forum software to engage in discussions about the community. Now, the Python community has discussions about this as well, but Rust kind of started with, we know that things can go badly here, let's think about how to make it go well. So um, we've both got good communities, uh, and, that, and that sort of thought and care goes into it. It's a general purpose language. So there is, the, I, I can't think of something where you couldn't sensibly write it in Rust. Uh, even shell scripting, run a whole bunch of processes stuff. Um, Joey Hess has written, I think it's Joey Hess, wrote a Haskell library to run command line stuff. So you can do shell scripting in Haskell, which is even more um, pedantic about exactly what types you're working with and so on than Rust is. And if you can make that work in a productive way, I'm absolutely sure you could do the same thing in Rust. I'm not sure it's a good idea. But I think you could do it and have it be productive and, and a net positive overall. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Python. I kind of went off the deep end on profiling this rather than writing the talk. It's why the talk took a while to write. Um, so it's a dynamic. So actually, let me just do a check, because I know this is a Python conference, but there's also been some non-Python non -Python talks here. So does everyone here actually write in Python? Okay, so I don't know whether those hands meant yes or no, and only half the hands <laughs> went up. So that's a type failure. So put your hand up if you don't actually write in Python. Don't as a regular thing. So like, there's about five or six slides, and in fact, there's some ex-Pythonists here. So, um, 
So look, Python is a dynamic language. It's interpreted. The types of the objects in it are examined by the, the runtime as it goes forward. It doesn't figure it out in advance. It has the ability for you to declare what sort of types you're working with, with the uh, MyPy work that's been moving into Python 3.5, 3.6, and it's evolving. And this starts to bring a bunch of static analysis to Python, um, more so than it had before. And that can greatly aid in programming in the large, both when you've got complex things you're trying to represent and also when you're working with large teams. And part A and part B aren't going to get the contract quite right, so having the interpreter and the uh, linters be able to tell you when it's wrong rather than running a five-hour test suite to find out that it's wrong is actually a really good thing. Uh, one of Python's really nice characteristics is you can do a lot with a small amount of code. trying not to cough into the mic. However, it's slow. And I know people are going to have issues with this. But look, fundamentally, it's slow. I've spent enough of my life working around those issues by running hundreds of separate processes doing one request each on web servers, even with uh, Twisted in the mix, to say it's slow. Honestly, it is slow. It is, however, very fast to create them. So you've got that trade-off. If you are some, a site like Pinterest, which is running millions of requests an hour and you're scaling out to thousands of machines, that sort of slowness starts to become a big deal. So um, that's one of the places where, you know, maybe Python is, is you're hitting the limits there, even with PyPy. Um, and getting compatibility with things like Eventlet and PyPy, I believe that one right now works, but that sort of thing is often a edge case. Right? New things that are done will be done in C Python and then you've got to wait for them to move to the more advanced VMs in the ecosystem. So I thought, you know, there's this classic thing, you write a Fibonacci number generator in the worst possible way, and then you use that to compare how your languages are. So I thought I'd do that. Um, so here, this is the, a classic recursive definition of a Fibonacci number. And I also want to highlight this n colon int, that is the MyPy syntax saying that this is an int that it's taking in. And this can be completely statically analyzed by MyPy. So it can figure out the types of everything there and it will know that it works well. And for a small example like this, it's really not very useful, but, but it generalizes. Um, so this is Rust code. It does exactly the same thing. And you'll note, except for the curly brackets, it's almost identical. So the first thing is, if you can read Python, you can read a lot of Rust. Straightforward, they've got very, very similar roots. The fn rather than def is kind of the first thing. And the arrow is the syntax for returning a type. And I couldn't remember the syntax for that in my pie, which is why it wasn't in the other slide. Um, e time. Anyway, um, so Fibonacci 38 is going to make a bunch of function calls. One interesting thing here, this exclamation mark says that this is a macro. So the Rust. <laughs> language can be extended in two different directions. You can write macros, which take in the abstract syntax tree and, and can manipulate it and output some other stuff in a normal compilation. It's built in. And um, the other thing you can do is you can write a compiler plugin. But that's only in the nightly branch at the moment. There's a back port and it gets complex. But you can do some really cool stuff. And if we have time, I'll talk a bit about that. Um, so I wanted to see just how big a gap we had. And I know there's a whole bunk, chunk of data to put in the slide and talking about graphs from the talk before. Who was in the talk before about graphs? Yeah, so graphing's terrible. So I just used the thing that would output a graph for me. Um, the takeaway here is that, so at the top we've got fib.py is the first one and then the um, Rust uh, binary was the second one. And the Rust binary took 99% less time. So C Python's kind of interpretive. We don't expect it to be fast when you're making lots and lots of function calls. So maybe we should uh, try running it with PyPy. 89% slower. So PyPy is 10 times faster than C Python for doing that. And uh, so here I've got PyPy versus uh, Fibonacci. And sorry, it's, it's 89. So I misspoke. That's Py, C Python versus PyPy, 89% uh, difference. But when you then compare PyPy to Rust, you're looking still at a tenfold difference in time. 
1.3 seconds or 1.4 seconds max um, versus a tenth of a second. So like there's, there's quite a big jump there. Um, and if you compare them all together, then you're looking at four orders of magnitude going from C Python all the way through to Rust. That can actually make a huge difference. If you've got a lot of fat code in your system that you're not really worried about, things that aren't hotspots, maybe this kind of gets lost in the wash. But being able to write inner loops in a faster language is a, a well-known strategy for fixing um, computational performance problems. Um, and I'll talk a bit about um, how that's kind of enabled. So for Rust, um, it's not dynamic at all. It is entirely static. The type of the, the functions that can be called in the type and the classes that the type has got associated with it, all of that is known at compile time. You can't do any of the tricks you can do in Python where you have descriptors and you can assign new functions to an object and call those functions at runtime. None of that. Well, you could implement using the, the um, callable trait and a hash table. You could you could kind of implement it on top of Rust, but it's not going to have any of the performance um, guarantees that you'd want out of Rust. So I, I really don't know why you'd want to do that. Um, it is, however, duct typed. So I said classes before, and Rust doesn't actually have classes. It has structs, which contain the data in a particular shape. And it has traits, which are like interfaces or abstract base classes. And they tell you what methods you can call on those structs. But you don't inherit. You can compose, you can nest. Um, and you can do runtime dispatch. So when you've got a trait that says, I've got a function Fred I can call on an object, you can have uh, a, a, an abstract pointer to that, which you can hand round, that hides out the actual data. Um, so kind of like a virtual method in C++, or like everything in Python. Um, but yeah, the big thing is you're not looking to incorporate implementation by deriving from something. You're looking to have, this looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, I can use it like a duck. And then all of your code can do that with different types, and it, it, it generalizes. It does that through um, generics rather than through interpretation. So you get some syntax, some visual noise to deal with as you, as you do that. Um, <clears throat> one of the defining characteristics of Rust is that it is a very, very safe language. Python is a very, very safe language until you try and use different VMs. So for example, if you run on CPython, you know that only one Python bytecode is running at a time. So operations like putting a thing into a dict are really, really safe. If you run on Iron Python or um, Jython or some of the, the other Pythons that people have created, the girl and the single bytecode at the time thing does no, doesn't hold true. And there's no guarantee that the underlying data types are going to be safe to use for multiple threads. And even if they are safe to use for multiple threads without locking, there's no guarantee that the, any assumptions you've made about what's going to be atomic or not atomic are actually going to hold true. So one of the things I've found, personally writing Python code in the past, is that when I move to a new VM, I find bugs. I find bugs because I've made assumptions that don't actually hold true. Um, Rust um, has all the type safety stuff of a strongly typed language, but it also focuses on data races as kind of a primary thing. And this evolved when Rust started. They had a particular vision, and it changed, and it changed, and it changed. What they've got now is a, a really good system with ownership. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, it's also really, really crazy fast. So there are a couple of routes you can take to fast. One is to have very abstract definitions of things and then compile it to a crazy back end that makes absolute sense for you. And there's some stuff out there uh, EMP Amada was doing years ago with Pepsi Cola and the, and the Steps system where they can compile high level representations into stuff that runs on your GPU. And that's cool, but no one's using it, um, which is sad, but reality. Uh, on, with Rust, however, everything that's on the heap is clearly on the heap. Everything that's on the stack is clearly on the stack. So you can write programs that run entirely on the stack if you've got a, you know, a, a, a problem that's, that's amenable to that and not pay any overhead for heap allocation at all, which is where that 
you know, 11,000% difference in Fibonacci came from because it was making all the function calls on the stack. All the data was on the stack. There was no heap allocation at all for that program. Okay. Maybe there was a tiny little bit in the runtime at the beginning, but there was none in the code that I had. Um, the, one of the big differences that you'll run into is it's got explicit compilation. On the other hand, running tox to run your lints and your checks and your tests, we're almost at the point of explicit compilation in Python. And to a degree, I think we'd almost be better off by saying, look, yeah, we're going to have that and make the I want to run a script without explicitly compiling it a special case or a wrapper. Like, what's it? Is it go run? There's a, a thing. It, yeah, there are things out there that can, that can give you that with completely compiled languages. Um, because all of the people I know doing professional, I'm writing lots of Python, are actually working in a write code, run a command to compile-ish that does all of these things. So I, it's not really that different. Um, it doesn't have exceptions in the same way we have exceptions. So for us, exceptions are a normal part of flow control and you, they're not exceptional, they're just a normal part of flow control, which is weird to people who come from other languages and tell us how wrong we are. And I actually love this in Python, it's, it's really elegant, it works quite well. Um, Rust does have stack unwinding, so it has non-local returns and it's moved from being a thing that was really hard to get at to a thing where there's a supported contract around it and you can use it. But it's not intended to be a primary case for flow control. It's intended to make sure you can clean up properly when a web server thread completely dies or something like that. What it does have is structured returns. So this is very similar to the Go idiom. Who here has written stuff in Go? Right, so enough in the room that's worth me describing this. So in, in Go, the idiom is that you return a value and an error as a tuple and you unpack that and you inspect it to see if an error actually occurred and then you manually return. And this is extremely <coughs> tedious. I, of all the things I can think of about Go that I would like to love, that is like at the top, because if I could love that, there was so much more about Go that I'd appreciate. Um, so I'll come back to that, but structure returns are kind of this, this big thing. Um, but the other big thing about Rust is that it's still really small. There, I say there's a lot to learn, but there, if you look at their RFCs, the list of things that they want to do to the compiler, to the language to make it more capable, it is huge. It's a really ambitious group. Um, so what we've got right now is a, a good, solid language. It's like this, but there's this whole space of stuff around it they want to enable and that the community is working on. So that's going to be really cool as that comes to, to fruition. All right. Um, so basic stuff about Rust. There is a single tool that formats Rust code into the standard thing. There is no debate about which way this should be configured or anything else. You run it, your code's done, you move along with your life. Um, it's got a package manager, kind of like pip. It's called Cargo. Uh, trying to write Rust code without using Cargo would be crazy. Don't try and do that. Um, so this is a bigger, a bigger set of code. So this is a, um, now why did I write this code? Oh yeah. So I wanted to just walk through some of the sort of things in Rust that's really start to look different. So import statements are you, um, you break them into two. You say that you're going to use an external module uh, by saying that the, the crate that you're going to use. And then you have a use statement which actually brings it into this particular namespace. So use standard colon colon iter gives me a symbol iter that I can use. The same as import fred dot bar as bar would give me bar. So the default is that it just gives you the last component as your local symbol. Uh, the struct definition is equivalent to a class definition. That's giving me a thing called fib. It's got two ints in it, and I can um, access those through dot notation really easily. Implementation of fib says this is where I'm adding methods that I can call. And you'll note that it's completely detached from the actual definition of the structure of the data. Um, this same syntax is used to implement traits to say I implement a particular abstract base class. So it gives you consistency. They could have made that be part of the same struct and then the other one different, but this is, I like this. Um, this function new here is equivalent to a static method because it's taking no parameters. Yeah, 
Yes. Yeah, we'll come. I'm, I'm pretty sure I've got a slide on that, so we'll, we'll swing back to that. Um, this here is the actual way you construct one of the fibs. You just pass in the attribute and the value you want it to have. And you can use that directly, but it's an idiom to have a new method that takes whatever parameters you want and maybe massages them a little bit and gives you back the thing that you're going to use. Note that there's no return statement. Just like in Python, if you run off the end of a function, none gets returned. If you run off the end of a, a method here, the last evaluated thing, the last expression, gets returned. So you, you only see return when you're doing an early exit. And so that's actually a good visual thing. You can see, oh, we're exiting early, and it really stands out more than it does in Python. So I kind of wish Python did this. Um, here, uh, here we're implementing a trait. So Tim's question before was, is, is, is it explicit? Um, I'm saying that fib is something that you can iterate over. So I'm implementing the iter colon iterator trait, and this trait needs two things implemented for it. It needs a type of the item that you're going to yield as you iterate, and that's going to be in a U64, and it needs a next function which is mutable, so I'm mutating state when I iterate across this, and it takes self. And it returns an option. So an option is an enum, and it's kind of like a union type uh, for folk who know type systems. Um, for folk that don't, it's able to be either one of two, it, 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 an enum can be one of many different things. Enums in Rust can hold data. So they're not just a mapping to C ints of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. They're actually able to carry data around like a struct themselves. This option one has two options, two values in the enum. One value is none, there's nothing there. And the other value is sum with the data that it's wrapping, which in this case is the result. So what this lets you do is, if you were thinking about pointers, you could have a nil pointer and a value that you're pointing at. But we're doing this without break, dropping down to pointers. We're doing this at a higher level in the system. So we can tell if there's something there or not. And if there is something there, we can pull it out and look at it. And so you know, this is pretty simple. Um, what, if, what else is there that we need to talk about? Let. If you want to, like in, in Python 3.5, you can use let. Uh, is it let? No, it's just a, just assignment, isn't it, with a colon. Yeah, so my brain is making mistakes. Um, so you say let to declare um, a variable you're going to use that goes on the stack in the current function. Like I said, stack and heap are uh, absolutely clearly identified as being separate things. Uh, if you want to be able to change it, you'd say let mute. Um, and it's very similar to all of the C flavor set of languages. You can do pointers and references and everything else. Um, you can put let expressions anywhere you want. They don't have to go at the beginning of a block or any sort of crazy restrictive thing like that. Um, and note that we didn't inherit from iterator. This is, this is an iterator, but we haven't inherited from it. Um, the type within next has been inferred. So the compiler's figured out all the types from the only information it's got is the structure itself and the parameters to the function. So I didn't need to use an explicit type there at all. Um, type inferencing across functions depends on explicit statements. Every function has to be explicitly typed, and that's partly to do with the linking. But also, in the Haskell community, the best practice there, even though the compiler can infer across the entire program, the best practice is to just be explicit at function boundaries. It gives you better error messages, it shrinks the problem space, at least you'd be clear about what you're doing. So they, they said straight from the get-go that that's what they wanted. Um, so inheritance. This up here, trait foobar colon foo, is inheriting foo. The trait foo is going to be Always present if you've got the trait bar. Wow, five minutes left. We are in trouble. Um, so struct baz here has an implementation of foo and an implementation of foo bar. If you don't have that line there, this would fail to compile. So even when you do inherit in a trait, you still have to explicitly implement the trait for each, each of the traits that are involved. Um, it helps with reasoning. You can very clearly see what's going on. Um, safety. Baz is a struct, and I assign it, and then I try and use it. It's moved. I can't access it anymore. 
this isn't an attribute of the underlying data so much as an attribute of the compiler. It knows what you have and haven't done. Um, under the hood, if you had two pointers, for example, and you move the pointer from one name to another, the data that's pointed at won't have been moved. The bits of the pointer will have been moved, but you'll still get this error. Um, this is involved in, in um, checking for safety in other ways as well. So this here says that you can't have multiple owners and making changes to a thing. If you want to have two people making changes to a dict, you've got to broker ownership to that dict somehow. Same for lists. And the, the API is a bit weird to get your head around, but once you do, it really starts to make a lot of sense. Um, the rules are you can have one mutable reference and no read-only references. You can't read from it if someone else is changing it, right down at the machine level. Or you can have as many read references as you want, but no mutable references. And the compiler enforces that and propagates it all around the system. The other thing you need to worry about is when you're calling into something and some data is sitting on the stack and you return back, if someone's taken a pointer to that data, they're now pointing into garbage land. This is a place where you can easily break things in C or C++. And so Rust has a lifetime concept. And it says, you know, if you're trying to hand out a reference to something where the lifetime of that is going to be less than that place you're handing it to expects, it, it will error at compile time. You won't find out at runtime. You'll never have that bug. Um, so given we don't have time, I'm going to jump all around and not have any idea where we are in the slides. Right, yeah. So this is the exception stuff. Um, and this is, like, if you look at this file double example, I just took this out of the error, uh, out of the book. There's a wonderful, wonderful book. That first line, let mute file equals try exclamation mark, file open path, map error, client error, IO. That, like, there's a lot of noise there the first time you see it. But what this is doing, that tries a macro, and that result at the top there is a, it's another one of these enums. But instead of being an enum with none or some, it's an enum with an error code or a success value. So when you get it back, you either have an error or you have the thing you wanted back. And the compiler can type coerce from the expression within that try into one of those two things. And try will early return from your function with that error. So that is exactly the same as the Go idiom in terms of the reliability of the code you get out but with about one-tenth the boilerplate once you've got all your, your, your scaffolding for it set up. Um, that particular expression in there is arbitrarily long to show mapping from um, options to results and a few other things. So I thought I'd have time to talk about it. I did time to talk, I, I swear to you. But. Right. So this is the equivalent code in Python. And down here, this match is doing... Um, destructuring. So it's taking that structure of the data, and this is why the structure of the data being separate to the code is so important. It can take the structure of the data and introspect it to give you back a whole bunch of things. So OKN is giving you the result value I was talking about, and the ER is giving you one of an enum of, of ERs, um, because it's unwrapped to get to your enum, and then this is actually equivalent to accept IO, accept parser, accept global catch -all. Um, and this is the machinery to implement that. Go and look at the slides are up on GitHub. Um, so they want to do a bunch of things that will make it much closer to Python, like direct language syntax for generators, coroutines, futures, async, a wait. This stuff is happening right now. Incremental compilation is happening right now to make it a lot faster for big projects. Um, but uh, there's a huge number of other things, like I said, the RFCs. So this is the current plan features. Algorithms beat everything. So once you go to a sensible implementation of Fibonacci, C Python's still kind of slow, but PyPy and uh, Rust get right down to the nose. Um, however, if you, I know we've, we've run out of time, but if you call from within Python, um, you can, where are my slides? Right, so there's stuff in there that you can look at for bindings. Um, I'm just looking for a, there, right. So this is comparing a iterator versus calling up from a JSON RPC. And JSON RPCs are slower, but it's not terrible. So my advice for binding is if you, you, you've got to go down to your C data types. That's what's going to happen. Um, so if you can, 
just uses JSON RPC written in Rust. Like if the overhead of calling is, is, is not compared to what you're going to get, that's probably a lot easier to manage. But you can do a pure extension module. Um. <laughs> All right, do we have any questions? Yes. Hi, thanks for the, for, for the talk. Um, so uh, if I want to write some sort of new Greenfield project, some sort of server, I don't, don't mind the sort of threading details, Go or Rust, and why? So if the question is between Go and Rust, I would say Rust. <laughs> because what I mentioned before, the idiom in Go for layering, error, for, for error handling, is it makes your code about three times as long. And that makes it harder to reason about the code. It makes it harder to uh, figure out where things have gone wrong. And because the, the essentially what you've got here in Rust is an error monad. And it, it really makes composing functions from different domains with different error types really, really easy. There's a little bit of boilerplate involved, but you, it's just about at the point you could mac put a macro around that. And then you get type safety and ease of development. So. In terms of the other stuff, the, the HTTP stacks, web servers, those are maturing in Rust and they're probably more mature in Go. But I think they're where they need to be for you to write pretty much anything these days. And the languages, this, what you get from the safety is much less, oh, I've got to go back and spend engineering time fixing that bug. It's going to be closer to correct the first time round. So to my mind, thinking from a, an engineering planning perspective, saying, look, you know, we'll go and build up a PostgreSQL module, for example, if, if one didn't exist, would be a reasonable thing to do because you can be confident that once you've done that, it's going to be rock solid. And you're not going to spend a lot of slow bleeding actually maintaining it forever. Any other questions? So uh, over there. Apart from uh, that Rust isn't faster than Python, uh, what do you think the most powerful feature on Rust? Apart from that, well, I, I, I probably, as I said, I kind of got distracted by the, the stats and went down the, that path for the talk. Um, so I think the, the biggest thing about it is the influence of language features like the destructuring and the enums that carry data. Um, I really like those because they give you a very Haskell feel to it without all the um, overhead of having to go to a non-procedural language. So if I write three lines of code in Rust, I know that they're going to execute those three lines of code. If I write those three lines of code in Haskell, they may or may not write them, depending on whether or not they get evaluated, and it becomes a lot harder to reason about it. But a lot of the stuff that makes writing Haskell really powerful, it comes from the type system and, and the destructuring. And we've got both of those things in Rust. So, yeah, that's... Sorry, I can't. Uh, if, if compare Go they use the microphone. Oh, sorry. If compare Go and Rust, uh, like structs and beautiful design is in Go as well. And if we compare this two, um, which feature of Rust wins? Well, so look, I, I don't think that you can really say win or lose for that sort of situation. Go is a beautiful language except for the error handling stuff. And if you like writing in Go, Great. Um, people are getting good results writing stuff, and go, writing stuff and go. I think that the readability and the ability to comprehend what's going on in Rust is going to be stronger over time than it is in Go, particularly as the features I was talking about, like actual generators, get added. There's already channels in, um, it's just a module in Rust, so you can write communicating sequential process style I.O. things. There's a futures thing in Nightly. So you can do um, an equivalent to async I.O. And Rust can compile down you know, some fairly large expressions down to a state machine for you and get really cool results that way. Um, so the, like over the next 6 to 12 months, I think we're going to set, I wouldn't call them killer features, but we're going to get the ability to write very easy to understand direct procedural code, easy to reason about, that compiles down to the absolute best possible way to implement that thing, and that has been pulled out sideways through compiler plugins and extension modules. Anyone else? Uh, yes, if we've got time, yes. Yeah. Yep, we do. Um, 
I didn't fully grasp the um, pointer part that you mentioned before. Does it essentially mean that you cannot have null pointer exemptions in in Rust? So no, but you can have them in Python as well. So <laughs> right, the 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 la if if you start with the language and you just write stuff in the safe language, then it is I I'd say it's impossible to get one of those exemptions. If, however, you start writing unsafe code, and there's actually a, an expression, unsafe, open curly bracket, stuff, in curly bracket, that you're saying, I'm going to step outside of the safety of the type system right now. And I had slides that we, we kind of skipped over. Um, when you do foreign function interfaces and you call from Python into Rust, Rust is going to have to not run its cleanup. Like if you're returning a struct back to Python, and Python's going to own that struct then you don't want to, to run your destructors. But you don't want anyone else in the Rust space to think they own that struct either. So you do an unsafe thing where you say to the system, hey, forget that you own about that. And well, it's, actually that one's safe because of interesting reasons, but um, when you come back and you say, by the way, I'm making a call on with that struct and this thing is actually a Rust source struct and it's owned by Rust, for the duration of that call, you want all the Rust safety to apply. So at that point, you do a very unsafe thing. You say to Rust, I'm going to, give, I'm going to tell you that this is a pointer to one of these things, and I want you to own it. So you, make the, you, you, you cast it into that, and that you have to wrap with unsafe. And then after that, all your normal Rust guarantees apply, and then when you return it back, you say, memory forget. It's, you know, it's, it's owned by Python again. All of which to say, you have the ability to shoot yourself in the foot, but you can, as I said, you can do that in Python. You can use the FFI or CFFI or an extension module to step outside of the bounds of the VM and break the, 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 the thing. If you do that, you keep both pieces. So I would say that what you want to do is you want to contain that, make it as small as possible, put it in a separate module, test it really, really, really rigorously, run fuzz testers, everything you can think on on it, and then all the stuff that uses it, you can depend upon because the guarantees will be preserved by the type system. Okay, so we've got time for just a couple more questions, and there was a guy over here and here, so we'll do those two, and then any other questions you can talk to the speaker yeah, after. Yeah, I'm happy to hallway track, I'm here, and Barry and I, oh, we should pimp the sprints. Barry and I are running sprints to get people developing on C Python. so Monday, Tuesday, come along, and any time I'm happy to talk about this, and as it, this, the URL is there for the slides, you've had lots of time to copy it down, if you haven't, I'm sorry. Get it from the video. You mentioned early on that the, the Rust community has made some really good decisions about building their community. Can you give some examples about what they might be and how they might be different to the way Python's done things? So one of the, um, yeah, so absolutely. So one of the things they did is they sat down and talked about mailing lists versus um, kind of Stack Exchange style forums and so on. And they have decided, they decided a while ago now, uh, I wasn't involved in any of this, so this is like second hand, it's all been blogged about and, and so on. Um, they got rid of their mailing lists. They have uh, a Stack Exchange-like thing, you, actual Stack Exchange, I think, for user questions, and then there's a developer kind of look-alike thing where you discuss things that you want to build consensus around, and then you have the issues in GitHub, and you have IRC for real-time discussion. So they don't have the mailing list um, kind of, the, some of the patterns that occur in mailing lists don't occur elsewhere with people dogpiling over a period of time. They do on Twitter, for example. Twitter is like mailing lists where you take all the evil and you just <laughs> amplify that. <laughs> so they went the other direction. They said, we want people to stop and think, and we want to, people who don't have any engagement in the community to have to earn the ability to, to comment in significant ways. And, 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 you know, and it seems to be working. Like, they have a lovely community. I mean, it may be that they just have three projects using it, but I don't think that's the case, because there are operating systems written in Rust entire kernel, everything. Um, there's the server browser from Mozilla, which is a replacement engine for Firefox that they're gradually phasing in. Like, there's some really big things that are big open source projects being written in Rust. This is the last question. Simple last question. Um, what does Rust do about object lifetime? Things like um, resource acquisition and initialization, uh, control destruction, what's the lifetime of objects? Right, so... Do you have access to a destructor? Yeah, so there, where is, oh, I probably can't find it because I'll get in trouble. Um, so there is a drop trait 
if you implement the drop trait, then you implement the function in it, and that function runs when your object is going to be dropped. Yes, so that will happen, so there's always only one owner, the type system guarantees that. The drop trait will run in two places, it will run when the thing goes out of scope, that's when it runs. If you wanted to make it go out of scope earlier, you can invoke drop on it directly, which will make it go out of scope right away and the thing will be nil, nil down and won't try and run again. It's not guaranteed that the drop trait will always run. And this is why I said earlier there's a thing that's actually safe, even though it sounds unsafe. Um, because if you do like a long jump or something in a, in a stack unwind, you can get into situations where things won't run. But in the normal course of stuff, and if you're writing routine code, it will always run. So it's like there's this edge case, and you have to be aware of it. But my. Uh... <laughs> All right. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> All right, um, thank you so much for speaking. Yeah. Um, so can we all just give Rob a hand? Yeah.